I felt like I understood dissonance much better and I could thread it through an entire song, whereas it's so linear on a page. But I also did poetry and also took photography. And during that time, there was what was called sort of the crisis of representation in qualitative research. And how do you legitimate knowledge that you're generating? And so uh, through multiple forms of representation, and poetry is a form of representation of the meaning of an experience. You're listening to Speaking of Language, a podcast recorded at the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. Each week, we explore a topic related to language pedagogy and second language acquisition. This week on Speaking of Language. Richard Kiley discusses transformative learning theory, international community-engaged learning, and dissonance. Welcome to a new episode of Speaking of Language. I'm Angelica Kramer, the director of the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. And I'm Sam Lupowitz, the LRC's media manager. We are excited to have Dr. Richard Kiley in the studio with us. Richard is a senior fellow in Cornell's Einhorn Center for Community Engagement and, among many other things, stewards the design and implementation of the Engaged College Initiative. Welcome to Speaking of Language, Richard. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's great to have you. So we always like to start our episodes by asking our guests about their background and path with languages. What does that look like for you? That's such a great question. Uh, you know, I um, my initial uh, sort of um, introduction to languages was in um, middle school, seventh hmm. grade. Mm -hmm. Mr. Flaccus was my Spanish teacher. Ah. We did role play. Got the costumes. Nice. It was it was really fun, and and I I got to know him later on. Uh, we're both members of Rotary International, so mm -hmm. we do international exchange together. And he said I was a good student, so that made me feel good. Aww. Yeah, and he said I was you know I behaved mm -hmm. as a seventh grader, mm -hmm. uh, and then you know I kind of ended up being that intermediate language speaker throughout high school, mm -hmm. where I just could conjugate verbs and sure. never really reached the you know, proficiency in speaking. And then I had an opportunity to, I was a Rotary Exchange student in Sweden. Oh. And so uh, Swedish wasn't something that I had studied. And so I took it upon myself to really have a goal within the first three months. I wanted to have some level of fluency. Wow. So yeah. every day practicing. Huh. Um, and then the school I went to, it's like a gymnasium, uh, the Hermelian School and Skulan. Uh, they, all the kids were required to speak Swedish to me. Hmm. And of course, all the kids spoke English really well, sure. Sure. but they only spoke Swedish. They were so responsible. Oh, wow. Nice. My family only spoke Swedish. So really within about four to five months, hmm. I really developed some confidence in speaking and, and yeah. you know, comprehension skills. Uh, so by the time I had a relationship uh, also with a woman named Brigida, and we spoke Swedish all the time. Mm -hmm. And so by the end of that year, People thought I was Norwegian. Wow. Because <laughs> it was in the northern yeah, yeah, part yeah, of Sweden. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And so I remember I was on a uh, huh. uh, flying back home, and one of the flight attendants said, Oh, du Norsk. And I was like, Yo, <laughs> yo, man, east. Like I just, you know, used a little bit of the yeah. Swedish because they say yo instead of ya. Ja. So um, anyway, nice. that made me feel kind of good, actually. Oh, I bet. Huh. Uh, that, so that was my entrance into languages. And then it just really turned me on to international travel and. Mm. So I got the opportunity to live in Spain for, uh, I lived in Greece and then I lived in Spain for four years and nice. went to the university there. And so really immersed myself in Spanish, a different way of learning Spanish mm -hmm. by being in Madrid and traveling throughout Spain. So I got sort of the colloquial language and sure. the more uh, university kind of language mm -hmm. as well. So I have a huge appreciation for languages. Mm -hmm. And I, I also, I think I might've mentioned to you uh, when we talked about the podcast, that my daughter, uh, my first daughter, Eva, um, I only spoke to Span I only spoke Spanish to her mm -hmm. like her first eight years, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Yeah, that is. It was hard when the second daughter was born to not just speak Spanish. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that was really important to me that they really sort of because I didn't have that exposure mm -hmm. when I was younger. Yeah. So it really influenced me in terms of like being a parent and yeah. kids. That's great. Does she still speak Spanish? Yeah, yeah, she does. She understands it really well, but I can't wait till she mm -hmm. has an opportunity to go somewhere yeah. where they only speak Spanish. So um, that's on the horizon. She's now uh, sort of going in. She's a freshman, uh, first-year student at Temple University. So mm. nice. 
she's planning on studying abroad. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. Her whole sophomore year. So we'll see. Oh, nice. She's thinking Italy, okay. but that's, you know, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We so, don't judge. No, no, not at all. <laughs> we love all the languages equally. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Yeah. So here on campus, you are working with faculty across um, different colleges on community-engaged learning, teaching, and research. What does your work actually entail, and what first sparked your interest in this area? Yeah, and so I would say it kind of goes back to um, the Rotary Exchange hmm. experience so much, actually. That's sort of a key marker in my life. Um so I, I took the opportunity to study in Greece and in Sweden and then Mexico and a variety of other places. And I really got interested in international relations, uh, did my master's in international relations. And then I came back to Ithaca and started teaching political science mm -hmm. uh, at, TC, at TC3, Tompkins Cortland Community College. And uh, an, um, a professor of nursing approached me. We were on an internationalization committee. The president had an international vision the new president at the time, Carl Haynes. And so he had a committee and we were on it and we got to know each other. And she said, well, you speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. I'm planning to go uh, uh, create a practicum in Nicaragua. And we'd love it if you we could co-teach together. Yeah. And so I created a course called The History, Language, and Politics of Nicaragua. And then she had a course, International Health in Nicaragua. And yeah. so we taught this six credit course brought some pre-med students, some nursing students from TC3, Cortland State, and Cornell. Hmm. And uh, I didn't hear the term service learning or community-based mm -hmm, learning. Mm -hmm. Sure. And that's in essence what the course was. We spent um, about a month in the Atlantic coast um, where they speak multiple languages. And, um, and uh, I was just blown away. Hmm. It was, I mean, the term I would use is transformative for mm -hmm. me and for students. Mm -hmm. Um, we learned so much in such a short period of time. It was an immersion experience. And I think when I came back, just realizing the impact, um, I decided, like, I'm that's that's my mm -hmm. life from now on. Nice. I really want to be an educator who supports different, you know, different ways to either teach or conduct research um, or and contribute to communities outside the institution. Mm -hmm. And so I immersed myself in the field and had an opportunity to... Um, to uh, get my doctorate here at Cornell, and that was my area of study. So I just immersed myself in the literature and the pedagogy uh, and different theories. So um, so that was the sort of genesis, and it just uh, was sort of a privilege to be able to study while actually running that program. And that program went all the way up to the pandemic. So that started oh, in wow. 1994. Wow. And so nice, for yeah. a number of decades, we yeah. continued that relationship huh. with that community. And um, I, over that time, I just learned so much about principles of good practice mm. when you work, when you partner with communities outside the institution mm -hmm. through either teaching and or research. Uh, I had the great fortune in 2011 to become the inaugural director of what we call the Center for Community Engaged Learning and Research. Mm -hmm. And um, we received a generous gift from, at the time, the Einhorn Family Charitable Trust, now the Einhorn Collaborative. And uh, so the first four years I ran this center, first four to five years. And we just, uh, in the beginning, we did like a listening tour and we met with mm -hmm. college deans and faculty that were doing community engaged work just to learn about their vision, their priorities, some of the challenges, how we could best support them. Yeah. And uh, after those five years, we received a very large gift from the Einhorn Collaborative, $50 million wow. to really um, create a transformative approach mm. at the institution and the North Star was really that every student would have an opportunity to have a yeah. high-quality community-engaged experience. So, so the kinds of activities that I engage in are working with faculty and students, mostly faculty and staff, to think about how they can incorporate community-engaged learning into their research or teaching mm -hmm. and how they can best support students in that effort, how they might design a syllabus, the kinds of sure. teaching strategies they would engage in certain challenges that come up on how to address them. And over time, we distributed in the first five years of the initiative over 2,000 grants. And some of them were big grants that were aimed at working with teams of faculty 
to focus on curriculum change so that it would outlast any person. So to really think about what would it look like to embed community-engaged learning into a major or a minor. Um, and, uh, and we had some um, fairly decent success with that, uh, but we realized that we really needed, in order to really shift curriculum and cultural norms around this, uh, we had to start working with colleges. Mm, yeah. And so now what I do, which is really exciting, and I would say um, it's sort of where the field uh, is pushing toward mm -hmm. and we have the opportunity to actually really better understand how colleges might engage in this work as a unit. Mm -hmm. And so now what I do is I work with the dean and associate deans and faculty uh, within the college and staff so every layer of the college should think about what would need to change in order to best support community engaged learning and how can our center support you? Yeah. And so we provide uh, three years of funding. It takes more than three years to sure. shift the yeah. culture yeah. and norms and rituals and policies and so on and, and structural support for this work. Um, but that's sort of a catalyzing uh, effort. And it's not just about the funding, it's really about the value proposition. Yeah, the mindset, yeah. And so that's sure. kind of where we are now is a big uh, portion of what we do is investing in partnering and collaborating with the colleges, each mm -hmm. college. So right now we're working with human ecology, um, the Johnson School of Business, um, uh, industrial, la industrial Labor Relations, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Architecture, Art, and Planning. And our next, uh, we're just starting to work with... Um, Ag and Life Sciences. Mm -hmm. Nice. So Cal's. Uh, so it's we're hoping to impact all seven undergraduate colleges. Yeah. And so we'll see. Yeah. Um, but that's been probably one of the most exciting uh, endeavors I've been involved in since I've been here at Cornell. That's great. And that's through the Einhorn Center. Mm -hmm. Terrific. So your dissertation focused on the nature of transformation in international service learning. What did you find as part of your case study research in Nicaragua? Yeah, you know, I was kind of ambitious. I remember doing my proposal <laughs> for, my, <laughs> for my dissertation, and I wanted to study the impact on community, the impact on faculty, the impact on the institution, <laughs> and the impact on students. Wow, okay. And so I did my presentation, my committee, one of the committee members... <laughs> who had been here a long time. He was in the Department of Anthropology, David Greenwood, who also uh, lives in Spain. Um, and uh, he just started laughing and yeah. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> you know, looks like I might have failed my public presentation. <laughs> we said, no, no, it's fine, but you have to choose one of those. Yeah. Uh, it's good you to know. be ambitious. <laughs> and so uh, I decided to choose, at the time I was studying a lot about learning and learning theory. So really wanted to know, and the students just... The stories that they told during and after participation were so powerful, you know, to capture that mm. um, was really important to me. So I really wanted to know what's distinctive about international service learning, global service learning uh, in terms of student learning. You know, what's so different about that in classroom learning? Yeah. And is there something about going to another country in a mm. particular context, particularly uh, a resource limited context, sure. the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua? Yeah. So I did a longitudinal study. And so I was able to capture eight years of data. Wow. And wow. that's really powerful. Longitudinal yeah, studies no are, Rare. you can really trace the journey. And yeah. so I really wanted to know, you know, a lot of times we do evaluations after, you know, a semester mm -hmm. or a year long program, but to study someone's life experience mm -hmm. and to have this kind of formative, powerful experience and see the impact of that over time was very, so I could sort of see what does that transformational journey look like? Um, and there aren't a lot of studies out there on thinking about transformation over the long long haul. So part of my interest was also to understand not only what they learned or what they continue to learn, but then they did they transfer or apply that learning in meaningful ways in other community mm -hmm. contexts mm -hmm. or in their profession. And so there were a lot of interesting findings there yeah. that helped me understand how we, uh, the principles and the practices we had embedded in our program and even shifting those. Mm -hmm. Um, because one of the things I found was that uh, what I called the chameleon complex, which was students really wanted to engage in structural change around particular issues, uh, definitely around public health in many cases, but policy change. And they'd get frustrated because mm. their friends and their colleagues and others, whether it was changes within their workplace or outside their workplace, 
to support communities that are marginalized, mm -hmm. they found that they weren't getting a lot of um, uh, collaboration. And so they were frustrated in sure. terms of applying what they had yeah. learned, particularly around structural change. Mm -hmm. And so it was sort of like the transformation about seeing the world very differently and what needs to happen in terms of mm. engaging in social change work and then how difficult that is and challenging and how it could take a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how do you prepare students to engage in social action post-program and what would you need to do before, during, and after mm -hmm. the program to support them? So I learned a lot about that because we didn't have that knowledge when we first started the program. Um, and often because you do evaluations right after the course, you don't often know what's happening when they sure. leave and they go off yeah. into the world. So this allowed me to really understand like, huh, they they were so, their intention was to change the world when they, hmm. when we surveyed them at the end of the course and then translating intention to action. Yeah. Wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of study around that. Yeah. And so I could really speak yeah. to that. Yeah, mm. that's interesting. Well, and is this what you actually refer to as dissonance then? What this experience of the students? Yeah. So what I found was, um, and when I had studied in you know the field of international education, a lot of um, study abroad does pre-orientation mm -hmm. work to prepare students, and some of the literature suggests that you know you can inoculate students so that they can respond to dissonance or discomforts or being out of their comfort zone. And what I found was there are certain kinds of dissonance that last a lifetime. That mm -hmm. is like a permanent marker. Mm -hmm. And you can't really inoculate against it. It's always there. And yeah. so in trying to translate it and understand it and how it might play a role in your life, um, uh, you know, was something that students had indicated, experiences that they had had in Nicaragua were experiences that they thought about all the time. It wasn't like I've had this experience and now I'm going to apply it. And, you know, then I have other experiences. Mm -hmm. It was something that was so powerful. I found that there was a difference between certain kinds of uh, dissonance, so the type of dissonance, the intensity disson of dissonance, and then based on whether it was low or high intensity dissonance, it lasted different periods of time and it was it led to different kinds of learning. So um, if the intensity was around language, um, which could be you know uh, a different level of intensity depending on the level sure. of language yeah. somebody knows, um, they could turn to practicing, you know, more while they were there or taking a course. Yeah. Um, or even if they wanted to engage in some more structural work, they could think about how the institution supports language hmm. and opportunities yeah. for students or access to these kinds of experiences. Yeah. Um, but another kind of dissonance would be uh, seeing children um, who don't have access to health or hmm. education or, um, or who, uh, or they're food insecure, mm -hmm. and that takes a lot longer, and it's a lot more complicated. And so, what is what's kind of learning will help address those yeah. problems. So, um, and of course, language plays a big role because understanding that problem better it means you have to talk to community members and understand yeah. the approaches, right? And to be able to um, listen mm -hmm. and to be able to collaborate. So that really language learning is a key part of that mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So you also composed music as part of your dissertation. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so at the time, a lot of um, the way I would try to process the experience I was having mm -hmm. was through music. Mm -hmm. And I love composing music. It's always been therapeutic for me. Yeah. And the power of the experience, um, I was able to kind of... Uh, understand and represent the meaning of the experience for me through music. And mm -hmm. I was starting to compose music based on the experience. And so a concept like dissonance, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about like a movie and the yeah. score that goes with yeah. that, uh, there's a certain kind of musical score that highlights, um, can highlight dissonance, I think better than narrative, mm -hmm. or at least for me, mm -hmm. I would, I felt like I understood um, dissonance much better and I could thread it through an entire song. Whereas it's so linear on a page. Mm, yeah, so you true. write about dissonance, but it actually was threaded through the whole mm. dissertation. But sure. how do you do that? And so the some of the songs that I would write about, um, what it would be around these themes that came out of the model that I developed, this transformative model. And then I would try, which was even more difficult to put some lyric oh, attached wow. to yeah. it. Mm -hmm. But I also did poetry mm. um, and also took photography 
And so I tried to, at the time, you know, I was really embedded in qualitative research. It's something I teach. And during that time, there was what was called sort of the crisis of representation mm -hmm. in qualitative research. And how do you legitimate knowledge that you're generating? And so uh, through multiple forms of representation. Mm -hmm. And poetry is a form of representation oh, of sure. the meaning of an experience. Yeah. And so I've never really compiled. I had one opportunity at a conference to take all of those artifacts, mm. the music, the poetry, mm -hmm. the, the photographs, uh, and it was a qualitative research conference, and to kind of share that. It was a little intimidating, but, um, but I think the more we can actually represent the meaning of experience through the word, through language, Absolutely. through music, through poetry, the hard part is there are very few disciplines that allow for these mm -hmm. multiple lenses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so at the time, I remember my chair was a little bit nervous about me presenting my <laughs> my dissertation as a pretty um, long composition and uh, but I still have it it's called searching for harmony mm, and I think that nice. really yeah kind of captures the yeah. meaning of the experience when you work yeah. with communities is often the community is uh, ex experiencing struggle and challenge and mm -hmm. so it's really a constant search to journey around trying to create a more harmonious set of relationships and conditions for people to mm -hmm. thrive so that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I think oftentimes committees have a very hard time figuring out how to assess something that they're not well versed in, right? That's a really good point. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's part of it too. It's like, how are we going to evaluate yeah, this? Yeah. In fact, I did an independent study with a wonderful professor, um, Jennifer Green, um, who was at Cornell in the, um, in the College of Human Ecology, and uh, she taught courses in evaluation. I did an independent study with her, and I evaluated a new class that was around social change. And I wrote up the evaluation and the observations in poetry. Mm. And our first kind of meeting to think about how to evaluate what mm -hmm. I had done. And I had a whole lit review that informed it, but then I had a lot of poetry. And um, she looked at me and she kind of laughed and she said, this is a new area for me. Mm, yeah. It's a really powerful area and it's oh. very important in the field of evaluation. So I need to like get up to speed so mm. I can properly evaluate. And then in one of the classes that I was taking, she asked me to get up and read some of my poems. Mm -hmm. And then she did this beautiful lecture on multiple forms of representation. Nice. So I felt really validated yeah, and yeah, affirmed. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, wonderful. Um, huh. Also had the opportunity to do poetry with Toni Morrison when she visited. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was one of the, I represented the ag school. We had huh. different grad represent representatives to share their artistic, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, creations. And so I read, uh, I read a poem uh, as part of that, and then she presented. Toni Morrison presented, but it was a real honor. And then afterwards, I bumped into one of my committee members. He was the one that laughed at me <laughs> <laughs> at the proposal. And he chuckled again, and he said, "I heard you re read some poetry, Richard." And I was like, and he kind of looked at me like quizzically, you know, like, you know, what was that like? It just was interesting. And I said, you know, yes, yes, I did. And, uh, if you're interested, we can talk more about uh -huh, it. Uh -huh. so. I assume that conversation never happened. <laughs> no, no, it didn't. <laughs> but that's okay. Well, that person's loss, I would say, if you ask me. <laughs> he was awesome. He was actually a really supportive <laughs> mentor. That's good. So if we approach um, community-engaged learning, transformative learning from a language education perspective... What tips would you have for our language teaching colleagues about how to integrate that into their teaching? Where can they start? Yeah, so um, I was thinking about, um, I've thought about that actually a long time, and it's like a perfect place, really, because learning a language with community is so powerful, right? So to have the opportunity to connect with native language speakers mm -hmm. um, and with different dialects and different sort of um uh, language that they um, share that you wouldn't know that would like exist in a particular community unless you were there. So I think study abroad, so, but mm. not just study abroad, Certainly. but study away like mm -hmm. domestically with populations that speak that language, mm -hmm. uh, given the language that you're teaching or in another country, um, you know, the global context is a, mm -hmm. a ripe area for, you know, learning a language. So I would say, the community-based learning is perfect for language teachers because it definitely will fit their learning outcomes. Yeah. And we worked with a course, this actually this mentor of mine, he's, when he retired, he kept working and um, 
we went to Sevilla mm -hmm. and work with the uh, program in Sevilla through Cornell. And I think Michigan also was a partner. And we embedded active learning and community engaged learning into their nice. courses and yeah. program. And they saw a rise in the interest in language and mm -hmm. the facility with language. And so they were structuring. I remember meeting three different community partners and going out and seeing if they'd be willing to work with the program. And one was a radio station oh, cool. yeah. that did a lot of community stories. Mm -hmm. uh, another one was a health facility. And then the third one was a community garden. Oh, nice. And they all agreed. Yeah. They were all excited to work sure. with students. And so uh, we ended up writing a special issue hmm. on teaching around that, a journal Great. on the experience in Sevilla and what we ended up doing. It was a whole mess of people uh, with the Center mm -hmm. for Teaching Innovation. Yeah. With uh, these two, with actually, so the language resource center was involved, hmm. and uh, and and then also this faculty member in anthropology nice. and a few other colleagues. So um, I just think that it generated a lot of excitement yeah. about embedding community engaged learning. So um, that's you know, so the opportunity is is fantastic yeah. for language that's teachers. Great. Richard, where can our listeners find out more about you and your work? Another wonderful question. <laughs> uh, they can uh, come to the Einhorn Center. We're in the third floor of Kennedy Hall. Uh, we have what we call the Engaged Cornell Hub, and we have a lot of different programs there. Um, depending on the kind of community-engaged activity you want to engage in, uh, you know, there's a number of different staff members that can meet with you. Um, and so, um, you know, come visit us in the Hub. We often will have uh, events or coffee hours. Mm -hmm. um, we try to sponsor a lot of different activities to welcome people. It's it's a. I met a student yesterday, who is um, in this program called the Laid Law Scholars Program, mm -hmm. and I you know I, I was saying I just met her um, through a colleague, and I said so what brings you to the hub? And she said well I'm a Laid Law Scholar, but I was told about the hub and I love it here. It's a space where mm -hmm. you can just kind of get away. When she was studying. I think she's listening to music as well. Um, but it really is a nice um, space to, for students to come and meet with each other, meet students from other colleges. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, staff as well as faculty are welcome. And we have lots of spaces to convene. So I would encourage anybody who's interested in community-engaged learning to come and visit us or send me an email mm -hmm. or, and uh, we, can, we can find a, a time to get together. Great. Sounds wonderful. Richard, before we sign off, we would like to ask you to share a word in a language that you speak, you love, you are learning, you may want to learn, that makes you chuckle. What's that word? Yeah, so this, I guess, we started with Sweden, so mm -hmm. I'll come back to mm -hmm. Sweden. Um, I mean, there's a bunch in Spanish. It was hard to actually <laughs> Pick think one. of one word. <laughs> so I might push the boundaries a little bit and go with two, but... I always ask, how do you say cool in any country that I'm in? Because mm -hmm. I just think it's like, you know, que buena onda. Like, I just love mm -hmm. that. It always conveys a really nice energy. Yeah. Uh, it's a positive thing. And so in Sweden, it's heftig. Oh, okay. That's a German word, too. So, oh, really? Is it close? Heftig, yeah. Ah, okay, nice. So, they yet the heftig skam on Huh. And so, uh, yeah, so that's cool. And then, of course, like there's a point on that a lot of countries have that. Um, another word in Sweden that I love, Swedish, is lagom. And what does that mean? So lagom is like not too much, not too little, but just right. Ah. Ah. And so like if you're <laughs> getting a coffee and you want some cream, you'd be uh -huh. like, ah, lagom bra. You know, mm -hmm. so it's just this really cool. It's like a, it's sort of like a yin and a yang. Okay. It's, like, it's kind of like harmony. I like creating that. harmony. It is actually philosophical. It's not just, you know, a practical term. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more word. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so here's another one that's really cool. Um, so in, it's Swedish. So there's fika, which is pocket. Okay. And fika. Oh. Now fika is a whole mess of things. It's a custom where, <laughs> and you really have to notice the difference. I'm sure I messed it up in, initially. <laughs> people are like, pocket, what? <laughs> but fika, people will be like, scavi fika. And scavi fika is, shall we go and get together, have some coffee or tea and some bullard or some, you mm -hmm. know, uh, pastries. Mm -hmm. And it's just every day. We was like, scavi fika and be like, yo, men vis. You know, like, hey, let's do it. Heftig. 
And it's totally <laughs> empty. Exactly. And then, it, and then at some point in that feed, guy, you're going to say log on. <laughs> so yeah, that's the combination of all those words. Yeah. But the tradition yeah. of just coming together and having a nice conversation and connecting with that's people. Awesome. And it's a great way to learn a language. Right there you have it. I love that. So Well, thank you so much for speaking of language with us today, Richard. This was great. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Next week, we are off for spring break. Tune in the following week to hear from Florencia Henshaw about guiding principles in second language acquisition and assessment. Until then... Auf Wiederhören! The Language Resource Center is located on the ground floor of Stimson Hall on Cornell's main campus in Ithaca, New York. Check us out on the web at lrc.cornell.edu or follow Cornell LRC on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Speaking of Language is produced by Angelica Kramer and Sam Lupowitz. Recorded by Sam Lupowitz. Original music by Sam Lupowitz, Dan Gable, and Joe Gibson. Thanks also to the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell University. As a reminder, the ideas and opinions expressed on this podcast do not reflect those of the College of Arts and Sciences or any other official entity of Cornell University. We thank our listeners, and do stay tuned for our next episode.